Hey folks, welcome back to the channel. We are once again doing some Postgres questions that I have on an office hours. Uh, it has been a little bit since I have actually been able to do one of these. Um, just a bunch of stuff going on, like really some of it, uh, well, one thing is I'm getting over, I don't know, some kind of cold virus-y thing. Uh, if you hear me cough, you'll be like, oh my lord, I think he's gonna die. But I'm actually on the mend at this point, so um, you may hear it in my voice a little bit. Um, ears are clogged and all that stuff, but uh, you know, you can't catch anything over a video call on the internet, right? So uh, it should be fine. Um, so in any case, that, that's uh, sort of waylaid me a uh, fair part of last week. Uh, like yesterday, we had a sort of crazy um, thunderstorm, I guess, electric storm a little bit in the morning and uh i it just it's a coincidence i guess like so we have these weird electrical storms and we actually saw like these weird like uh like sparks inside the house it seemed uh around like some of the outlets and whatnot like it just it was a little bit bizarre and then i went out to the car and the car wouldn't actually start uh almost like the, the starter just wasn't getting enough juice um, but otherwise, like, the radio would come on, the air conditioning was good or whatever, right? Like, for, for a car that's sitting there not actually running. Um, so, uh, ended up having to deal with that problem. Ended up jumping it. Uh, I got it running once on its own and drove it a bit. And it seemed like it was maybe going to be okay. It died again. So, like, I ended up jumping it. And then we had to get a battery replacement. And in our particular car, this is... Uh, so, the way, you know, the way of the world... Uh, I recently saw this thing about AI is going to create a spam problem with like emails and whatnot and then the solution to that problem is more ai right to actually filter those emails and be able to tell like what's the good ones and whatnot and so anytime you can get in a cycle and i'm like this this is how you know ai will be regulated because congress doesn't like it when people muscle in on their turf and i think congress is definitely the ones that are like no no, no we create the problem and then we solve it and you love us because we've solved your problem so I feel like in this case, so when we went to, to do battery replacement, I was going to just like swap the battery out, right? That's easy. But we called the dealership because there was some other stuff that seemed a little bit weird with the electronics. And they were like, nah, I'm pretty sure it's just a coincidence with the electrical storms. But uh, you can bring it in. We'll hook it up. Uh, we won't charge you for that. And then, you know, if you need a battery, we'll swap the battery, whatever. So they do the battery swap. But in this particular car, uh, it's one of those that has the uh, auto stop uh, start when you pull up to like a stoplight. It has like that feature in it um, and the feature is designed to save you gas. It really doesn't make much of a difference at all is what I have found, at least in the driving that I do. Uh, so although I did definitely disable that when we were trying to get to the dealer because I certainly did not want the car to die at a stoplight. So bonus points for that feature. In any case, what they found apparently uh, that was still the original battery from the manufacturer when we bought the car. And what we ended up finding was or what they ended up finding was that because of that start and stop, they actually undersized the batteries when they designed the cars. So now what they do is when you go in to do that first battery swap, right, they actually replace the battery and they replace the ba battery like sort of housing platform that is in the engine. Uh, and so they kind of have to redo that. So there's a more of a charge because you get a bigger battery that is uh, can handle the, you know, more starts and stops over time that you're gonna have because of that feature. Um, it's a bigger battery and needs more space in the engine, so they have to like reconfigure some stuff, whatever. So I'm just like, oh great, so you're charging me more for a problem that you created uh, to give me a solution that really isn't all that good, you know, uh, with the whole gas saving thing. Like, not that I'm opposed to saving gas or whatever, it just it doesn't make that big of an impact. Um, I would say it's like a 1% difference, maybe. So um, yeah, anyways, so, got that fixed yesterday i was gonna go live uh, yesterday or do a video yesterday um and uh ended up punting that to today but here we are again like i am uh, glad to be back doing this uh i missed you folks um so but we are otherwise in the throes of uh you know real uh spring uh thunder showers and good stuff like that down here in uh the good state of florida so um i had a few questions i wanted to just cover with you today we'll do that and uh, get on out of here um, but before that, I'm going to do sort of like a question story for the first one. Uh, it's on a topic that came up in the Postgres Slack. Uh, I, if you're not in there and you like to do like real-time chat stuff and get help that way, I totally would recommend that. Um, but one particular one came up and it spawned a couple of after questions in the DMs and whatnot. Uh, and so I just kind of wanted to talk about it 
because uh, I thought it was interesting. And also, like, there's a good reminder in there. So we'll do that one first. And then I've got, uh, I think, like, four other questions. I just kind of grabbed randomly out of the pile. Uh, and we'll do those. And then we'll all get along on our merry way. So with that as the agenda, let's do uh, question number one. The original question that we got uh, was basically, how much disk do we really need to run a repack process? So for those who aren't familiar with it, PG Repack, a uh, very popular extension. You probably should be familiar with this. I, I mean, most people, um, maybe not everybody has to deal with this, but uh, super popular for dealing with, typically I would say bloated tables, although some people use this as an index bloat management tool. Um, honestly, like I have always used like cron jobs and uh, if you go back far enough, like um, create index concurrently, drop index concurrently as a method of dealing with this. And now I would say you can just do like create index, uh, no, re-index concurrently. Um, so you can do that now, but people used to use, or I guess still do use PG Repack for that piece of it. Um, but the main thing that I like PG Repack for is if you have heavily bloated tables that you need to clean up, Repack, what it does behind the scenes, it basically creates a new copy of the table, rebuilds all the indexes, and then swaps it out in the catalogs. Oh my God, yes, I know, really, don't actually look under the, you don't want to know. Um, and uh, so then you get a new sort of compact version of the table. Uh, the problem, of course, is that because it has to build a new copy of the table, it needs space to take care of that, right, and to do that. So uh, that leads to the question like, well, how much space do you need? If you look in the Repack docs, what they will tell you is basically you need twice the size of the table uh, and its indexes in order to do this, right? Because it's building a new copy of the table and a new set of indexes. But what most people, if you think about it just a little bit, you'll be like, well, I don't, don't, I don't need a full copy, right? Um, twice the size of the bloated size of the table because the new table I'm creating should be smaller because I'm getting rid of all that extra bloat space, right? So makes sense. So then it's like, how much do I actually need? Well, obviously, so now you would say like, what you need is the size of basically a, you know, whatever your existing bloat is on the, on the system, right? The size of that table and index, whatever levels of bloat are in there. And then whatever would be the compact size of the table and freshly created index, right? So, uh, so you don't necessarily need double, but you do need some. And in this particular case, the uh, original poster of the question the reason they're asking this is because they were running out of space. They didn't really have enough space on their system to do that uh, to, if they were, were really going to have to have, you know, a full double size of the table and indexes. So we got out some discussions and whatnot. A couple other people chimed in. Uh, and in particular, like I had made a comment about, um, you know, hey, if you're really hard up for space, what you may want to do is re-index those indexes uh, specifically. Uh, before you actually run repack. And my thinking behind that was, and I didn't go like super in depth into this um, and maybe should have, cause I got a couple of questions about it. So um, the reason for that was that in the scenario that this person was in, where you want to run a repack on a heavily bloated table and they had said that the table was heavily bloated, but it also had a bunch of indexes it needs to deal with. And you know, you don't have enough space or you know you're having space issues running out of space, if you re-index the indexes first, right, before you run repack, any space that is dead space in those indexes can be reclaimed on the existing version of the table before you have to run the repack and, you know, double everything. So you can potentially gain some space to move with if, if you need that space. And, you know, that's kind of the question there. Um, if you're that tight up for space and they're running out of space, so they probably are that tight up for space, they could do it. Uh, and then, so there were some questions around like, well, wait a minute, I thought like if you're doing repack, right, like that's going to rebuild the indexes anyway. So why would you re-index it beforehand? Um, is that still, is it a thing that I would normally need to do and whatnot? And so sort of the, the key lesson about all this is, you know, like, well, uh, so the main thing I wanted to, to sort of talk about it here is understand that like in a lot of these cases, whether it's, you know, email, uh, the mailing list, like chat services, whether it's like Slack or IRC or whatever you're on, right, Discord, uh, whatnot, um, or even just like when you're reading blog posts out there, it's always important to remember that like sometimes the advice that is given, uh, and I think this probably is more true with Slack and then, you know, still somewhat true with email and then less so in a blogging space, but can definitely be very context dependent, right? You have to understand like context matters. Uh, context is, uh, is needed for most of the help you're going to get on the internet. Um, and this is definitely no different. Like I would not normally tell people to do that. Like I've run Repack all the time. 
and, and whatnot. Like, no, you don't normally re-index before you do it. It really is only in the case where like, hey, I need to get every bit of free space I can before I run a repack process because I'm running out of space. And in that scenario, re-indexing ahead of time, you know, that is actually worth it, uh, potentially, because you might be able to get enough space out of your indexes to give you enough space to redo the table. Um, so I kind of wanted to revisit that question here because, you know, I, I try to mention, uh, you know, the disclaimer of like, hey, the answers I'm giving here, you know, this is not official consulting advice. Uh, this is an old, you know, DBA, like Sharon is, is tips and tricks. Um, and that's definitely true, right? Like take, take the advice I get with a grain of uh, salt in the sense that the questions I get, and usually the ones that I'm answering here, you know, I don't have a lot of detail on them. Uh, and that's fine, because I think generally you can still give useful answers even without super amount of detail, because these processes are, uh, and the questions that come up, you know, they're common enough that in most cases, the general answer can help. And I also try to give you like, here's the trade-offs of why you might want to do one way or the other. But in the case of like something like Slack, where there is a conversation going and we are getting a lot of detail, the more detail that's in there, the more specific the answers can be towards that particular question. And in my mind, like that's one of the things I look for, like who are who is giving good answers in a forum, especially like Slack? Because I do often see people will ask what I think is a somewhat specific question and somebody will kind of give a drive-by answer that is fairly generic. And I just think like, you know, either this person doesn't really know the material, so to speak, um, about Postgres and how it works and whatnot, uh, or they haven't really thought about what the person actually asked because based on the information they've given, the answer you gave is generic and really is not a good answer for them, right? Not because it doesn't, I mean, it, it, I would say it, it probably doesn't solve their problem, right? Not because it doesn't address the scenario, but it could be the wrong answer because they have given you context that you should have incorporated when you were going to give them back the answer. So um, I kind of want to revisit that and just as a reminder, right? Uh, like I say, this, you know, none of this should be considered official advice. Um, no paychecks have exchanged hands uh, when I'm doing these Q's and A's. So uh, the people that are asking, I'm happy to answer. Um, and when you see these later and, you know, if you're revisiting, you're like, oh, I wonder about that particular topic. Like, um, probably these answers are good in the context that you're getting them. Uh, but if you have some very specific thing or whatever, or, you know, just be careful if you pull out something like that. Um, don't start like, oh, I need a cron job to re-index every night and then I can run a repack or whatever. Like, don't, don't start doing that. Like some of these answers definitely are context dependent to the people who are asking them. So just be aware. And if you have questions about that, obviously you can send me a question, you know, whether it's an email or on Twitter or whatever, or drop a question sort of about these videos, drop a question in the comments. Uh, if you have a question on the answer that I have given for some, you know, when trying to apply it to a more specific thing. Uh, and I'll certainly try to answer those if they pop up. So uh, so that was my first sort of question and story uh, and just wanted to revisit that um, because I thought it was it was interesting that like some, that particular thread was an interesting thread uh, that, you know, a number of people chimed in on and I did get some follow-up questions and I thought, you know, context, uh, you know, that was a, that's a big thing. Like there's a lot of advice out there um, some of it quite bad and some of it, you know, could be good in the right context, but you got to make sure you understand, is their context materially different than what I'm doing? Uh, so there you go. All right. Um, with all that, uh, let's get on to, I guess we'll call this question number two. Uh, and this one, uh, so this is definitely a more generic question, which is how do you do update if exists else insert? And I uh, will channel my friend, Peter Gagan, who I, I don't always agree with on this particular topic, in fact, but the simple answer is you don't. Uh, and he's given a number of conf conference talks about why you don't um, that involve race conditions and whatnot. Um, at a very high level, uh, I think probably people are trying to do, you know, pulling language from some other database. I would guess probably MySQL, because I think they made upsert really popular as a term. Um, in Postgres, the way you would do that in theory, uh, and there's three different ways, but I think what you want to look at first is insert, you know, on duplicate key update, um, which is kind of like a reverse logic of update uh, if exists, else insert. Uh, but it solves race condition issues that are actually very complicated that I'm definitely not going to go into on this video um, and, and whatnot. Now, there are other ways to actually accomplish that, uh, but they do potentially add race conditions into your system. So you have to understand like, what is the nature of this update else insert that I'm trying to do? 
Uh, and I think this is where I get into disagreements with some folks that, you know, if in cases where you know you have, uh, if it's like one writer um, that's only ever going to be doing this, then you don't really have race conditions, right? Uh, or if you also know like, oh, my workload is, you know, 99% updates. Um, and so I don't really worry about a lot of missing ones, uh, should almost always be updating something that's there. So only very occasionally will we actually have to insert something. The performance characteristics you might need out of that would be different than if you said, well, actually, you know, 99% of the stuff I'm doing is inserts, uh, versus, you know, and so we're only rarely updating a thing or, you know, or some ratio in between 50, 50 updates and inserts. Like the performance character, so she might need out of that system, might be very different uh, and enough to matter that you might want to try some other method. So, but again, like I'd start with, uh, you know, insert on duplicate key update uh, as the first method. The second method, if you'd like to get yourself into trouble, would be to try to do something with a uh, CTE where you actually build the CTE based on an update uh, and then you can kind of join back to the, so you do like an update returning, should give you rows back. If you get no rows back, you do an insert on those values. Um, that's another way to sort of approach this problem. There's different ways to, to deal with that. Um, so that's another way, but it's definitely more prone to race conditions uh, if you have multiple riders going on and whatnot. So, you know, I probably wouldn't necessarily recommend that uh, as a way to do it. Uh, certainly if the index on duplicate key solves your problem, that's definitely better. You know, just there's performance potential issues there. So, uh, and you can do like insert returning, you know, update, flip it around the other way. Again, depending on what you're trying to accomplish, so really sort of nitty gritty of that. Um, the third answer I should give, and uh, you know, I will be honest, like I don't actually have a heck of a lot of experience doing this in Postgres, but it is an option now. Um, would potentially be to use merge uh, as the way to solve this problem. So, but you know, I've played with merge a fair amount. Uh, in Postgres, uh, in definitely in a played sense of it. Um, there are some interesting corner cases. I do want to do kind of a deep dive on that and, and get into that. Uh, and hopefully at some point I'll get around to doing it. Um, having played with merge and other database systems, like, yeah, there's definitely potential foot guns to the whole thing. Um, but I think like for completeness, I would say that might be, you know, that might be the answer you're looking for. Again, like it does depend on nature. Are we talking like OTP? Is this a big data load or whatever? Um, update if uh, exists, else insert as a general concept, merge could get you there. Uh, so that's probably, maybe even that's the second way I would recommend doing this uh, versus like doing it with CTEs uh, if you want to do that. So that's probably what that, we'll put that in as a third path uh, potentially to get there. So there you go. Hopefully that answers that question or certainly gives you some space to explore a little bit more. Question number three, can we use both SQL and NoSQL in one application at the same time. For example, using like MongoDB with Postgres. Uh, and I think, you know, this is, comes uh, more from like a web developer space uh, where you're just sort of thinking about like, should we have multiple backends? I, I would assume that's where this is kind of coming from. Uh, and certainly the answer is you could do that for absolutely. Um, you know, you if you write your app to grab data from multiple sources, People do that kind of stuff all the time. So you can certainly mix and match. Uh, I think the thing I would caution or, you know, the thing that I would sort of mention is if you're doing this, like I would be curious, what are you storing in MongoDB? Uh, and why not just store that database in Postgres? That's the answer I'm going to give you. Um, and, you know, you can make like, put like FerretDB on top of it. It's like a Mongo on Postgres emulator kind of plugin thing. Um, if, if you feel the need for that. Uh, but you could probably store, you know, uh, to me, like there are very few use cases where you really need Mongo uh, the way it is designed. You know, if it's just like, well, I have JSON data and I need to store that someplace. Like, well, you can definitely store that in Postgres. You can probably index it better in Postgres. Uh, so there's not really a need uh, necessarily to spread out and use two different systems. And if you can use one system for both, that's probably going to be faster and easier. So uh, before I would jump into trying to use both of those in one system, I would just point out again, like Postgres just has like through the plugin architecture, there's just so many different things you can do with it. Uh, it's kind of the same thing. Like this is just to me, like it's an updated version of the question of like, can we do Elasticsearch and relational data with Postgres 
you know, that you would get that question like 10 years ago or 15 years ago or whatever. Uh, and it's like, you know, maybe you just want to use T-Search and do the full text searching like right in your Postgres database. It actually works pretty good. Um, we had a client once where uh, they needed full text search for their search stuff. Wasn't like the core of their business. And, you know, the developers were instantly like, oh, we're going to throw up Sphinx and use that for our uh, search stuff. And I was like, you know what we're going to do before we start building out architecture? Uh, I'm going to throw some full text search indexes onto the system. And uh, why don't you just code the thing up and we can use those to begin with and we'll prototype it because we got deadlines and features to hit for this particular uh, service. This was working with um, National Geographic, actually. So it was, you know, pretty decent traffic and whatnot. Uh, and like that got us pretty far for, for what they needed because it was like, well, you know, we we're just checking the box. Like they needed a search thing. So we built a search thing on top of this data that was otherwise stored in the Postgres database, you know, that was needed for other things. Uh, and it saved a lot of like sort of architecture headaches and whatnot. And I, again, I just think that in most cases, if you can prototype it, you know, on the Postgres thing, whether it's, you know, like, uh, was it PG uh, hyperlog uh, data types or JSON data types or, you know, whatever it is, XML data, you can do that as well if you really had to. Um, if you can do that in Postgres first and use that as a prototype, like to me, that's the simple way to go until you know, like, oh, this is more of a thing. We need a different set of performance characteristics, you know, whatever, right? There, there can be need a uh, need to branch out and do other stuff. But for starters, like to me, that's how I would sort of do that uh, and try to avoid having to run both SQL and NoSQL uh, if you can just do it all in, you know, Postgres. So question number four, uh, how can you import a SQL dump file from MySQL into Postgres. And this one definitely depends on how the data was exported from MySQL. Uh, they're using the term SQL dump file here. The problem is that, uh, and I, I'll, again, I, like I'll admit, I haven't looked at like the newest versions, if the SQL is like any cleaner than it used to be, I wouldn't expect it to be. Um, because primarily like when you do, you know, when you use like MySQL dump and dump out the database, even if you use a SQL, quote unquote, dump uh, format, it's really designed to go back into another MySQL database, right? It's not designed to go into some other database, even though it's the quote unquote SQL format. Um, now, there are some, some things you could do, uh, flags you can pass in or whatever to like MySQL dump to make it more anti-standard SQL, uh, which may or may not work as far as getting it into Postgres. So, you know, like step one is like, well, just try to jam it in there, like run it through PSQL, see if that works for you. <coughs> there's my there's my horrible cough coming coming to the front. Um, so you can do that uh, with uh, my SQL dump. Uh, if that doesn't work, and it very well may not, uh, there can be all kinds of issues I've certainly seen. Then the thing I would redirect you to is um, probably go look at PG Loader, and it has some pretty nice capabilities as far as pulling data out and doing dump files and getting them to be essentially ANSI SQL. Uh, and then whether you're doing, um, you know, like if you want, if you're doing MySQL to Postgres, which is what the, the op sort of asked about, it should work really well for that. Um, but even once you have ANSI SQL, if you want to put it into like Oracle or SQL Server or something, uh, you probably could do that. Because uh, I think you can get clean enough SQL using something like PG Loader to do that, so. Just a, just a thought. So, yeah, it, it's sort of a trick because like you say, it's like the SQL format. Um, I used to talk to folks that would do the MySQL dump in the SQL format. Right? It's supposed to just be super ANSI friendly. Uh, and then they'd load it in Postgres. They're like, why won't Postgres like speak ANSI SQL? And you go look at it and you're like, dude, there's no ANSI SQLness about this. Like you're using like backticks for like, you know, coding stuff or whatever. Like that's not ANSI SQL. So um, I imagine the state of that is better, but I don't believe it's anywhere good enough that you should expect it to actually work in multiple databases without flags or using some other kind of tool. So that's just me. Um, all right, let me do the last question here. Question number five. Uh, it's also kind of an interesting one. Uh, I've, I've ranted on this in various places before, uh, but I think useful again to always revisit some of these things. Um, so the question is, what are the potential drawbacks of using stored procedures in a database design model? And that phrase, sort of database design model, 
Uh, I'm going to interpret that again. This is all, you know, context matters. But I think, like, when you're laying out, um, you know, tables, views, whatever you're going to have, uh, thinking about it from a logical point of view, right? So you're doing, like, entity relationship diagrams and, and things like that. So you're sort of trying to figure out, like, what is the design going to look like? Uh, at some point, usually then you couple that with like a physical piece of it, right? Because you uh, eventually the data's got to be on disk somewhere. So you've got to do that. But the key, I think, to me is when you put stored procedures in there. So people like to use like tables and views and map those things out. And sometimes they'll do even like an enum type. Can I've seen that surface up there. The problem with stored procedures for all of this kind of stuff is that to my mind, like you can, you can mask this if you try. But generally speaking, like stored procedures don't fit well into the relational model, right? They're not an object of the system in the sense that, like, they're not a relation, uh, you know, in that sense. Like, if you think of it in relational theory kind of mode, right, put your put your relational hat on um, and think of it that way. Like, it's not like a table or a view, which you would say at a logical level, these should be interchangeable, right? And then physically, maybe we got to deal with these, you know, differently. Store procedure doesn't really fit in that. And it's not accessed the same way as a table view, you know, or even like a materialized view. Like it's accessed differently. To me, the way to think about store procedures, as I look at it, is think about it more like an API on top of the database. Uh, and so you, if you want to follow that model of like, well, I've got, you know, sort of my logical and physical layout and here's where the data sits and how it rests, right? Um, and here's how data gets in and out of it from a like this data when when you get it you're going to insert into the here maybe a trigger is going to write something over there or whatever right you can think about it in that sense uh and the trigger to me is like an abstract sort of construct um maybe you use that as part of uh stored procedure as part of building the trigger yes but that is like an implementation detail that in the logical sense you don't actually think about that and even actually in the physical sense right you wouldn't think about that from a design like you know give me a layout of the thing you basically just draw the air draw the line over there draw an arrow right it's kind of like a foreign key if you can think about it in that way right like you don't think of foreign keys as necessarily an object in the system it's just an aspect of the system that describes a relationship between two things uh a store procedure uses a trigger to be the same way store procedures that stand on their own right like the problem is you can make a store procedure that's like uh and if you look in the pajila database um github.com slash exila slash pajila uh you know, if you look in there, like, you'll see I have procedures in there that are like, uh, you know, uh, like rental report or whatever. That might be a view. But there's some in there that, like, you just call the, the stored procedure to get a report back. Now, you could have written that as a view in many cases. Sometimes you can't because you actually are doing some data munging in there, right? Uh, and in Postgres, if you really want to fake it, like, you could put a view uh, uh, that just calls the stored procedure potentially. But if you got to pass stuff in, like, now you're doing something different. And that, to me, is, like, where we start to get into different bits of it. Right, that like a relation in a more traditional sense is sort of your, you know, bag holding the objects uh, that are in there, right? They're holding the rows of data and, and whatnot uh, and have aspects of that. Um, but you don't think about like, what is the where clause uh, when you query it? Like you query it and you use SQL to do that. With a stored procedure, like if you have in and out parameters and that's a mandatory piece of the puzzle, then that actually, you know, that uh, affects what you would actually see or get back or how you can even interact with the thing, right? And that really should be abstracted away if you're doing database design modeling, in my mind. So I, again, I go back to thinking store procedures are more like an API. Like all this stuff, uh, you know, there's a, a really hot, uh, as microservices kind of got big and it was like, oh, one microservice is your database and then your other microservice is going to be this like uh, API layer that sits between your database and other applications, and then applications will talk to that API and whatever. And it's like, oh, we just abstracted what used to be stored procedures out of the database. Maybe some good reasons for that, not always for sure, because if you then go look at, you know, like then you end up writing XML or PC or something, like who knows. Um, but in any case, like if you think of your stored procedures as an API on top of your data, and you're like, this is how people are gonna interact with the system through that, design that more like an API. Go look at how to do good API design, not how to do good relational design when it comes to building out, you know, like a suite of store procedures to interact with your data. That's what I would tell you to do. And I think you would find, uh, you know, one, I think developers would actually much prefer working with stored procedures that have been designed with sort of that API first mentality. Um, just, you know, I think the layout would probably end up making more sense and be less ad hoc and whatnot. So 
uh, I think that would be good. And then actually, if you had to abstract that out in some other way, right, if you end up building an API, being able to reference back to those stored procedures probably would be actually pretty useful. So that's how, uh, like, I think of the drawbacks are you just end up munging a thing that really is about access in and out, right, and, and how to marshal data one way or the other, or get information out of the system, which is what stored procedures uh, in that sense are really good for. Um, and that can end up mucking with your database design model, right? Let the database design model really be a model for the data itself uh, and have nothing to do with like how you're marshalling data in and out. It's not that you're not going to consider that in building out the database design model. You will consider about what, how is the data coming in? Where is it going to go? How are people going to look at it? You're going to look at those things when you do the data design model. But when you mix stored procedures into that, uh, again, I think like you end up at best, you would be uh, sort of, I think, polluting the database design model because, again, stored procedures aren't going to hold any of your data, right? No, none of your data is resting in the stored procedure. It really is all about how do I marshal data from one place to another, right? And the database design model, again, to me, like, it's really about where does the data sit, where does the data rest, uh, you know, at the end of the day, or I guess I would say at the end of the transaction, so... Uh, any case, that's that's how I look at it. Uh, hopefully, again, that's useful. Um, it's not an area that gets discussed a lot. You know, again, like much of the industry has kind of gone away from stored procedure use uh, in that way at all anyways. Uh, so, you know, be that as it may. I think it would be a little bit better embraced uh, if we approached it more API first. But, um, I mean, I can also see the arguments about scaling that stuff out and writing in different languages and whatnot. So... You know, I don't think I would like turn the industry around with that idea, but I think it will make any system that you're dealing with better if you approach it that way. So uh, hopefully that's helpful. Uh, hopefully you've gotten something out of some of the questions today. Um, if you made it this far for sure, I would say please uh, hit the like button, hit that subscribe button. Um, trying to get a few more subscribers onto the uh, channel. Uh, we can do some more interesting stuff with the YouTubes uh, if we can get a few more subscribers. So that that should be cool. Uh, if you know someone working with Pestgres, uh, feel free to share it with them. Uh, and as always, if you have any questions about what we talked about here, feel free to drop it in the comments. Otherwise, uh, I believe I'm back on a more regular schedule, uh, barring more injuries or whatnot, so, uh, or illnesses or whatnot. So um, take care of yourself until the next one. Uh, and if you can, take care of your database as well. I'll see you later.